We collect. Collect. <laughs> uh, karma collected. After what we thought would be a disaster. Yeah, it's all it's worked out fine now. It's all working. So, uh, welcome, Mr. Paddy Kingsland. Paddy, thank you so much for doing this for us. Thank you. Uh, I'm Harry. This is Luke. Sir. Hi there. Hi, Paddy. So um, what we thought is we'd um, we'd get you on the podcast and just ask you a few a few questions and uh, see how it goes. Um, so firstly, uh, before we do anything, I thought I'd just better plug your album that's out, the Listen for the Light album. Oh, so, thank you. So um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that before we uh, dive back into the past? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it involves something in the past which... Um, was many years ago when I did a series called The Changes, mm. which uh, was a, a, a drama sort of series for, uh, uh, actually for kids, really, but it was uh, uh, based on um, some uh, rather good books, and uh, which had been adapted by Anna Hume, who is, uh, uh, was a producer at BBC. And it's a, like a dystopian sort of... Uh, uh, thing which was uh, based on the world going mad and everybody smashing up machinery and that sort of thing. Quite a bit ahead of its time, actually. Yeah. It's sort of due for that now, mm. really. Um, and one of the ingredients in it was some Indian people who helped this. The, the heroine was a young girl who got separated from her parents in all the sort of chaos and was befriended by these Indian people. And so um, I tried to sort of crowbar in a bit of a sort of Indian flavour into the music mm. of that and uh, got my friend uh, Nick Gom to play the sitar on uh, some of the tracks yeah. for that reason and um, so uh, that's, uh, that's I mean I knew him already obviously but uh, many years later um, we decided we'd try and make a, an album which had synths and electronics and guitars and things uh together with the sitar yeah uh or mainly the sitar really together with the other stuff and yeah. uh, so we made an, an album and we also got it pressed up uh in vinyl so uh that's called listen for the light and if anybody wants to order one, it's on my website. I was just going to say paddykingsland.com. That's it. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, nice and clean. <laughs> so um, if you don't mind, I want to sort of take a step back now into sort of into yesteryear and yeah. find out how you started. So you were born in Hampshire. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Um, um, nice place to to be brought up yeah, it could at that be worse. time. <laughs> yeah. It could be worse. And it was uh, a, a, a period when it was, a, you know, it's changed a lot since I was there because when I was there, uh, my dad had a very small um, farm or he shared it with, with, with his sister. Um, and it was very small and really not very economic you know but he had a milk round and a horse and cart to deliver the milk round in the village and grew a few things and had cows and bits and pieces and my aunt had chickens and you know it was that kind of thing yeah. so it's brought up in a really kind of lovely atmosphere and in those days there were quite a lot of those small setups um who were scraping along mm. And every time they kind of just about paid the bank back, the government would change the rules and sort of uh, alter the price of milk or something, and uh, and up down they'd go again. And eventually, mm. I mean, most of them have been wiped out, yeah. or they've become uh, industrial parks or something. Yeah, you know? yeah. So it's rather sad, um, but it was a very ideal, lovely time to be brought up in 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 the country. Yeah, and that was, of course, in the fifties and early sixties. So at what point did music enter your life? Was was your family particularly musical or was it just something that you sort of latched well, on to? Well, my mum was, um, yeah, my mum was musical. She played the piano properly uh, and, you know, m music and all that kind of uh, yeah. carry on. Um, she also um, accompanied my grandfather when he sang uh, Danny Boy. Uh, at family things. <laughs> That's a song you can't start too high, by the way. If you do that, you're in trouble. There's, a, there's um, so many songs that are like that where 
if you're in the wrong key, if you t- if you t- there's no way to move it. It's got to be exactly where it was written. If it's if you move it up a, a few mm. semitones, you've had it because it's way too high, or it's way too yeah, low. Yeah. It's it's. I mean, dancing in the dark is another one of those. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which gets higher and higher and higher. If you start it high, you've had it. The you amount know, of times, crash. there's a few ABBA songs that are like that. The amount of times I've had to accompany somebody who wants to sing thank you for the music or something. And it's it's uh, just in do, a horrendous they key. They start higher than Well, you they would. just sort of, you know, they'll give you the indication of, oh, um, I think I want to sing it about here. Are you sure? <laughs> you see a lot of well, that. Yeah, with, it yeah. starts slow. Start yeah. da, 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 da. So if you start it, da, 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 yeah. da, da. Yeah, their gone. eyes are going to burst Should by the time again. they get yeah. to the final <laughs> chorus. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I mean, that was that was my mum, and um, as it turned out, um, she was brought up. Obviously, um, you know, she was. I suppose she was brought up in the sort of thirties, hmm. um, and in those days, girls didn't have, uh, weren't given the same chances hmm. as boys, because the priority was get the guys educated and the girls you know had to sort of trail along a bit so um she she was good at the piano she had piano lessons and she could have gone on to do more but wasn't really it wasn't she wasn't allowed to they didn't have the money to do it yeah. her family because they put all the resources into into giving careers to to, to her brother so um she was very sympathetic to the idea of um you know, being encouraged to do what you wanted to. Mm. And um, so anyway, she sent me off for piano lessons with Miss Cobb. And Miss Cobb was uh, a bit sort of uh, strenuous, really. I mean, <laughs> you know, she used to bang your hand with a ruler if it <laughs> wasn't quite right and all that sort of thing. And she was um, not interested in anything except um, very straight kind of classical stuff. Mm. And I was quite lazy and didn't really get on very well. And Miss Cobb ended up saying, look, if you don't practice, which I didn't, um, that's it, I'm afraid. Um, so I got fired from the uh, oh. <laughs> the music lessons. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that was that until um, I saw a guitar in a junk shop and managed to borrow the money to buy it. It was just an acoustic guitar. And uh, that's where I sort of began doing all that. And there were friends at school, obviously, and we all got together and did sort of gigs in village halls and those sorts of things. Yeah. So that was the start of uh, playing music and also having a kind of very primitive tape recorder. And a, a, another friend had another recorder so we could sort of bounce between the two, which was quite... Um, it was quite crude, but it was, you know, it, it was uh, the beginnings of doing all that stuff. Yeah, it worked. It sort of worked. <laughs> <laughs> if the temperature was right, mm. it was in the right spot, leaning on the right book, it worked perfectly. <laughs> That's right. And we did actually take a, a an old piano, pianola-type piano, which worked on rolls and things, and uh, pulled the whole thing to bits and used the keyboard to make a um, an electronic organ. Um, which would really not stay in tune for very long. But it was, uh, yeah, it was a fun thing to do. So you mentioned when you had the piano lessons and you didn't practice. That's such a, everybody says that whenever you, whenever we speak to anybody, like I teach piano and nobody practices, but they sort no. of, you know, everybody that I've spoken to who've had lessons over the years always said that the practicing was the thing that they struggled with. Even with that, how far did you get in your sort of musical development and sort of knowledge? How much of the theory was there, like the reading side of it? How much of that was, did you hone? Well, I always had a bit of trouble with reading music and I still don't mm. um, read it very well. Um, I can write it down now for other people and I can write down for, a, I could uh, write down for a brass section of string quartet or something like that. So I can do that. And, of course, with the computer stuff, it's a lot easier to do that. But I did used to do it, um, you know, on manuscript paper. So yeah. I could do I could do that. But reading it, I've had a, tr- a, a problem with. And I think that's probably some form of being dyslexic. I don't know. Yeah. And a lot of people yeah. seem to have this 
trouble. Um, also, being born at slightly the wrong time um, for really getting into that was um, the fact that a lot of the people I knew who were session players mm. were slightly older than me and started off either in brass bands, which was yeah. a great way of learning, or the army, because a, a lot of people learnt that yeah. way. I mean, my kids learnt um, with lessons, and I did try and force them over the kind of that critical time when it's like, yeah. oh, God, you, know, you know, can't really make it sound like anything. I think that's it, isn't it? It's frustration that it's really not sounding yeah. fantastic. It's it's one of those things where it's 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 just quite tricky to get across that if you sort of push through that, it all becomes easier. But it's just sort of finding the motivation to just do it. No, it's my trouble. Well, yeah. well I mean, all this it. modern stuff that you've got going in the background there with the keyboards and stuff yeah. is a great way of of doing that. I mean, my my granddaughter is starting the drums, and um, you know. I can sort of play along with her, yeah, and it gives her a bit of a boost when mm. she's just trying to get the basics together, and um, it's like that, isn't it? There's the, yeah. the technology does help a bit. Yeah. Miss Cobb didn't have that uh, um, yeah. <laughs> advantage. <laughs> That's what I <laughs> you do. Um, when I was learning the piano, it always seemed like music to be a collaborative thing but then when you're learning it's such a uh what's the word yeah i know what you mean like you sort of i think the way people perceive that you're going to learn an instrument to be able to play with other people whether you're yeah. going to go into orchestral or <laughs> just into a sort of performance space with your music Not that like, having to yeah. sort of practice on your own and right you need to do all your scales and you need to do your harmonic minors and your arpeggios and then you'll be able to do this <laughs> in a b r s m piece grade one yeah and you've got to do three of those yes. and then you know where like you said with your granddaughter where she can play on the drums and you can just play a 12 bar along with her and yeah. she's mm. like that's mind-blowing that you can sort of just do that whereas i think a lot of teachers it's music teachers not all but they are sort of still stuck in that sort of well you should learn everything first and there's some truth in that i think that you know you need to have the fundamentals yes, down I, I, absolutely i mean and, and um you know one of the one of the points i've noticed with her she's only just started by the way so she's just at the beginning of all this but um she plays the drums and the guy who's teaching her at school has got her into reading music right away which yep. is great and she can do it. I can see that she's going to be able to do it. And she has these charts uh, with the drums and the odd sort of simple fill and that sort of thing. Yeah. But she gets frustrated if she does it wrong, she'll stop. And, of course, I'm keep saying, going, let's, just, <laughs> let's get a rhythm going and just keep going. Yeah. And if you falter or go wrong, it doesn't matter. We just keep, keep going. Yeah. And so there's a bit of a kind of... Uh, a conflict there, but I don't want to stop what he's doing at all, you know. Mm. Um, so I don't interfere with that because it's right that he gets her through that learning stage of the music. Mm. And um, I mean, most drum parts end up, you know, with a with a bit of rhythm and then etc. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, we'll you carry on. You've got the, oh, just I know it. You know, <laughs> yeah. Either boom chicked or diddly diddly. You yeah, know, yeah, one or the other. And. Uh, <laughs> No, sorry, I'm I'm writing off. Uh, if I see you've got yeah, a premiere. If there's any drummers listening, <laughs> I apologise. I'm not right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, that's right, isn't it? Um, yeah. So uh, it's a fascinating subject, and I don't know. I thought they had started to get all that right now at schools and and things like that. Yeah, I think they're sort of um, they're starting to. I think from what I can sort of make out that especially i think some of the old like when i did all my piano exams and everything it was all royal college of music so it was all what they pick mm. their set pieces mm. you know there's no mm. sort of faltering with that but there's sort of this rock school and uh, rock school lcm that where they pick cool. well they pick sort of contemporary songs for you to play so they sort of mm. they've at least heard them mm. or they're going to hear them on the radio or their parents know them i think that's the encouragement mm. i think parents struggle with it because they don't know BWM nine two five. You know they've never heard of. You know, no. that's it's, right. They really I struggle mean, with that. 
I was I was lucky, I suppose, because my mum did know all, yeah. all about that. Mm-hmm. I think she was quite disappointed that I didn't sort of fall into it in the way that she did. You know, she had an aptitude straight away and and did very well w- w- with piano lessons and uh, reading yeah. everything from, you know, um, Bach to Mozart to, you know, Beethoven, you know, all those types of piano pieces she could play. Yeah. Sight reading, you know, I've really, I'm still envious of that. Yeah. <laughs> so when did the composing side come into it for you then? Or was it sort of, you mentioned that you sort of played in bands. Is that sort of semi-professional yeah. stuff before you sort of turned? Well, um, you know? the, the first thing was um used to, uh, I mean, that was the thing that got me interested was playing with somebody else. Another guy had a guitar, and we used to play and mess around, and he had a tape machine. We we, we sort of re- recorded a few very rough things, and um, and we quite enjoyed it. And then somebody else joined in w- with drum kit, and um, we used to practice in my garden um, at home. And um, the local guide mistress, uh, girl guides, um, was having a jumble sale and said, oh, you can come and play at our jumble sale. So we did, and it, we had to frantically get more than two numbers together. Yeah. Hmm. And that was, in those days, it was the shadows and yeah. that sort of and instrumental things. Yeah. And um, we put together some things and played, and she gave us uh, some money for it, it's which a, I thought was great, you know, because she was raising money for the... Yeah camping and all that sort of stuff but she th- said no no you've done a you've done it for us and we we'll pay you and um that really got us going you know we yeah. thought well this is good we can do things here so um that that that's how, that's how it began and um then gradually various other people joined in you know sort of bass player and that sort of thing and it sort of uh, evolved but we always did make up tunes mm. um perhaps not very good ones, but we're, we're sort of fooling around with that. And then when I joined the BBC as a technician, we, the people there, we started up a, a band and we, we we kept writing because that was the time when the Beatles were around and they were writing and it was plain that everybody was writing, you know. Mm-hmm. They weren't um, getting somebody else, they weren't doing covers. So yeah, much. yeah. So so we did that. Yeah. So what sort of so I'm assuming you were playing guitar at this point. This was sort of your yeah. band experience that you were playing. Mm. Can you remember what gear you used at that time? Yeah, I had um I had a, a a Fender Stratocaster which I had got and I think I paid 75 pounds for it second hand. Mm. It was um uh it was it was for sale in I think I would say the year when it was when I bought it was probably 1964 or something like that, and um, you can look it up online. <laughs> and um, I, uh, I went and bought this thing, and um, I had a Vox AC30 amplifier and a Selma Echo unit, which was a little tape loop Echo, and um, used to play with that and then um when when i got to london i had this uh guitar and everybody was saying oh no you don't want those anymore you want a gibson you know and i got sort of railroaded into getting rid of this lovely guitar which i loved and buying a crap sort of um second hand gibson uh, which was i mean i know they're great guitars but this one was obviously had been through the mill and <laughs> Mm. wasn't set up properly and went out of tune at every two seconds, yeah. you know. So. You could drive a and, bus um, under the action. A lack of knowledge uh, uh, was the problem. And um, so I, I traded my Fender Stratocaster uh, Cherry Red, which had been to Hamburg with a band who I bought it off. At the same time, the Beatles were there and had been played. They used his this guitar, apparently, yeah. to do... So it had a bit of provenance, which mm. wouldn't doesn't matter anymore because I sold it for forty five pounds. That's oh. terrifying. A sixty strat, regardless of sort of the you know 
any sort of relation to the Beatles, a 60s Strat nowadays, you could probably buy a Rolls Royce. Sorry to sort of rub it in. <laughs> it's, yeah. I don't want, I don't want a Rolls Royce. Petrol's so expensive oh, now. Right. So, yeah, so. Um, but yeah. <laughs> no, it's a bit galling, isn't it? Yeah. But somebody, yeah. somebody I'm sure has that now and yeah. it's in a case or something, glass case. Yeah. Um, having said that, I've, um, I, I got, a, I got a new one a few years ago, mm. um, which is amazingly better than that old thing. Oh. Um, because, you know, things like the bridge yeah. is improved and it sounds fine. They're so stable like now. I think I've played a few, you like, make whenever I've been to like Denmark Street or anything, and they're sort of the top shelf guitars that you try. And some yeah. of them just don't. They sound great, and they've got a sort of. There's a thing about them because they're sort of old, and there's you know, they've yeah. got that feel. But they just, I don't think they're as stable. You know, you look. Oh, at, they're not as stable. You know, no, they're just no. sort of. It is what it is, and they're horrendously yeah. priced now. Like it costs well, of a course fortune. They are. Yeah. You know. Well, people ha have a sort of dream to have something like that. Yeah. Um, which I did when I was, you know. 14, 15, yeah. you know. This, my and, old piano um, teacher had a CS80 that he sold in about 1984 for nothing, like next to nothing. But if you've got a, a CS80 on eBay now or on Reverb, you're talking probably 60 grand at least. No way. Like horrendous amount. I can't for... believe that's true, but I, I, I've seen it. Yes, I've actually you know, seen wow. those prices quoted. Yeah, it, it's... Uh, Peter Howell, um, who was at the workshop when I was there, used to use that a lot yeah and uh then i mean apple max came in and various other bits and fair lights and all that yeah. sort of stuff and he didn't use it anymore well it's like all of the like arturia um vst soft synth stuff sounds great now like i used to have a mini moog and it yeah when i was when i was sort of tour gigging a lot uh, it was on top of a Hammond, and it fell down the stairs as they were loading in, and it just smashed to bits. Like it oh, had no. just gone. But the Arturia stuff sounds great, but I think the only thing that you miss with that is the sort of the tactile having to use the mouse to like adjust everything. And it's a it's a fiddly process, but it does get you the sounds. It's it's there. It's and I think and from an audience perspective as well, you don't they wouldn't they wouldn't notice, you know, the difference. They wouldn't notice the sound. But there are a lot of people now who like to see the gear piled up on the stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's fine if they want to help carry it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I always say that, like, if whenever anybody says, have you locked the door or anything? Because, you know, somebody steals that Rhodes. And I think, well, if yeah. they can break into the house and take the Rhodes down the stairs and get out without me noticing, they're welcome to it. <laughs> you know, job. Yeah, and without doing their back in. Yeah, you know, <laughs> if they're not in agony at the bottom of the stairs with the Rhodes <laughs> on top of them, it's sort of... You know, yes, it'll, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. So let's yeah. um, let's move on to the workshop then. I do have a question. Oh, yeah. you have a question. I do have a question. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Go on. Um, I just want to know what what the journey to get to the workshop and what brought you to working at the BBC. Sorry, I, I didn't quite. Oh, is it in there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, I think it, your no, you level can... is a bit low. You can you can do that. Is it? Turn. That's fine. Um, uh, I was wondering what your journey was to. Um, Get, you know, working in the workshop and um, what brought you to the BBC to work there? Well, um, funny enough, I didn't really know that much about the workshop. When I was a technician at the BBC, I was working on the kind of rock and roll end of things, recording people and also light entertainment was bundled in with all that. So mm. it was quite a fun job that I had at the BBC. And then they said one day, you've got to go on a course for more advanced, you know, technical stuff, you know. And um, part of the course was going around and seeing various other departments, one of which was a radiophonic workshop. And I actually said, no, I really don't want to go on this course. You know, I'm quite happy, you know, I know everything, uh, <laughs> um, which they assured me I didn't. Mm. <laughs> and... Uh, so I went on the, the this uh, little visit one afternoon to Radiophonic Workshop, and uh, there was Desmond Briscoe, who was in charge at the time, who gave a lecture 
to, I don't know how many of us there were, probably a dozen or more people sitting in one of the rooms there. And Malcolm Clark was there with his bow tie and a tape machine and playing in examples for Desmond of a tape machine. And Desmond said, well, if you, if you want to kind of visit and see this in more detail, please say, uh, and we can fix that for you to come for a week if anybody's interested. And I certainly was interested, so I did fix up to go for a week. And I think the reason it was a week, these things in BBC language were called attachments, where you, you know, you mm. went for a period of time to see how it all worked and learn how, how to do things. And it happened in all departments, like vision mixing or any other, any other department like that where you could go from any job in the BBC, you could go and have a go at this thing. I mean, certainly, you, you couldn't just walk into being a, 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 an advanced research engineer or maintenance yeah. engineer without the proper training, but you could go and have a look, and then if they liked you and they saw you had actually, they would, they would uh, send you anyway. So I, I, I did uh, join... Uh, uh, you know, the queue, and went on a, a one-week week attachment, which went OK, and then got invited back for three months, and then uh, another three months, and then eventually uh, got a job there, which mm. was uh, very, very fortunate. And the timing was good because there were a lot of local radio stations starting up who needed uh, jingles and things. Mm. Uh, BBC Two was just starting, so the BBC was expanding, and there was a need for this kind of material. Yeah. Uh, so I was lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. Mm. Is the real answer to that question. Yeah. But, uh, so if we can, we're going to move on a little bit. Just um, we're going to sort of try and hone in a little bit on your workshop experience. Probably one mm. of the most famous things that you did in the workshop was some of your work for Doctor Who. So, yeah, yeah, in or at least sort of that's sort of the the public sort of view is that Doctor Who was mm. the, sort of the thing, even though you'd done Hitchhikers and you'd done stuff yeah. after that as well. Is um, so if, if we take the example of Doctor Who, oh, well, more sort of the example of what you did for work in the workshop, how did that work mm. come in and how was it sort of divided up between like yourself and mm. Malcolm Clark or you know, whoever was. <laughs> Was it just sort well, of pick um, a piece of paper and that's yours? Well, Desmond Briscoe was the, in charge at that time. And um, he, 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 you know, somebody ring up and describe what they wanted and he would uh, allocate somebody to do it. Hmm. Everybody did slightly different things, you know, where there was a different take on things. Yeah. Um, when I joined there, John Baker was king of tunes, really. Hmm. Delia Derbyshire did sort of weird things, uh, but also did Doctor Who theme tune, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and she could do tunes, but she mainly did sort of, uh, you know, dramatic, uh, ethereal backgrounds and mm. things like that. Brian Hodgson really concentrated on effects. Yeah. Uh, David Kane was there and was doing, he was getting into ed medieval music and putting electronics with sack butts and things joining in and that sort of stuff so there was a sort of variety among the four main people there i joined and malcolm clark was going into the kind of uh, more sort of arty kind of way of looking at things i like doing kind of poppy type tunes and things like that so i uh, ended up doing a few of those things um but uh, peter howell once said uh, when the phone rings and Desmond gets a job in, um, he comes down the the corridor holding a piece of paper as if it's a hot potato <laughs> to get rid of it, <laughs> to give it to somebody. You deal with this. Um, deal with it, yeah, so to, anxious to get it going and delegate it straight away. But um, so um, he kind of got to know what you could do and... Uh, went from there. I mean, I was working on a pop magazine programme 
uh, called Seen and Heard, which was a Radio 1 show mm. which went on Saturdays, uh, which uh, I put together with a uh, the guy who played the sitar, actually, Nick. Uh, he, was a, he was a studio manager as well. We were both in that department. So we worked on that show uh, and uh, t- editing tapes, you know, a uh, quarter-inch tape, razor blade, and all that, which we got quite good at putting together slick, proper kind of stuff, which is what that was about. Um, and they wanted a new theme tune, so I did did a new theme tune for that, which is uh, 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 something that uh, I did in my very early stages, and uh, it had drums and stuff on it. And um, Desmond, I think, got to know that I was I was in the sort of tunes area yeah of it but um you mentioned doctor who and um doctor who uh but by the time my period of doctor who came along um which was into the 70s i had a lot quite a lot of experience doing other things Mm. so i worked up uh you know a bit of knowledge about how to write stuff to pictures and that sort of thing and I'd also worked on Doctor Who. I'd done, um, I did a series called um, The Sunmakers, mm. which uh, I did some sound effects for because Dick Mills was away on holiday and uh, I covered that one because um, yeah. he was away. And um, so I knew the whole process and how it all worked because it's kind of a bit of a sausage machine in those days. Yeah. Know, they, they had tight tight deadlines. So and, how uh, how was that sort of structured uh, then? So when the story when you were commissioned, so the the workshop is commissioned to do four episodes or whatever it is of of Doctor Who. Yeah. Let's use Doctor <laughs> Who as the example. How uh, how long did you have to do that? Did you have anything to work from? Because mm. I've, I've seen I've seen yeah. some clips of Dudley Simpson who sort of would sit with the director, saw a certain thing, would score everything out, and then it would sort of be mm. a quick turnaround. How mm. how did that sort of process work in your experience anyway? Well, um, with us, so um, um, Dudley had an orchestra, a small, a very small orchestra, mm. and then came to the workshop and added a synthesizers on top of that. Yeah, it got mixed down, goes along. So process uh, was uh, in his day and in ours. Um, you'd have a, um, a session where you go and review an episode, which was finished. The episode hadn't been dubbed sound wise but all the videos was there cut properly uh <coughs> together and, and and that was the end of that it was no no they weren't going to alter the cut mm. uh, so um you look through it with the director dick mills was usually there looking at the sound effects that he was going to be putting in the director suggested where he would like the music or asked you what you thought and uh, depending, but very often they had a pretty good idea of where they'd like music and where they didn't want it. Yeah. So, um, and I think they was 20 something minutes per episode. Yeah, I've seen something, I think most sort of episodes of Who are around sort of 22, 25 minutes. How much of that, was it sort of, and I think I'm sure I've read somewhere that there was sort of 14 minutes of music was commissioned per episode or something there's sort of it was it could be that that would be quite a lot i think it sometimes a bit less than that yeah um and um so you'd walk away with m1 m2 m3 all written out where it was and there was a (coughs) when i started there was um a videotape that gave you um with a burnt in time code in the window um so you could see where everything was And then you had a week uh, to do an episode in, after which um, there would be a dub, usually, yeah. at the end of the week. Or, um, if and if it didn't take place then, you were on to another one or something else. <clears throat> so, yeah. So, so, um, so it was a review, uh, do the music, uh, go to the dub and argue about how loud it was. <laughs> That wants to turn it up. It I don't want to hear what yeah. they're saying. I want my music up. So, yeah. Go on. Well, how much influence did you have over the music um, for the episodes you did do? Like, um, well, was, well, it was depended. Uh, Mercy or uh, 
Well, it was at the time. I remember um, they wanted something a bit new. Um, go over to synthesizers type stuff mm. at that time. <clears throat> so more electronic. And um, different people did different things. Peter Howell did different things and uh, Roger did. Uh, mm. But Peter and I were the first to do scores mm. for, for Doctor Who. And um, they kind of left you to it. I mean, they sort of said what they were after yeah. in the scene and sometimes um they wanted to patch up something they didn't think was working you know yeah so cover it up with a bit of music <laughs> fix this occasionally yeah. that happened but i mean i just used to <clears throat> completely busk it and just did what i thought at the time hmm. and um i liked themes so i had to develop a theme and repeat it yeah and i found that worked for me um <clears throat> and then they would come and uh, have a look at it and if they didn't like it they would say you know yeah. and occasionally had to alter things but not usually major things yeah um i have heard of composers for doctor who not at the workshop um but having had their music <laughs> i remember dick mills came in and mentioned this guy who'd done uh, I won't mention his name. He was well known. <laughs> oh, God. <but>, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he did his score for a Doctor Who, <clears throat> and uh, but couldn't be at the dub. Mm. And he saw Dick later on and said, How did it go? And uh, Dick said, Well, it, it went <laughs> very well. In fact, most of it went. <laughs> most of it's gone. Because <laughs> the producer didn't like it. And. Uh, uh, I can imagine. Decided he'd play it on sound effects rather than music. Okay. Which is, you know, an yeah, approach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I never had that awful experience. They did occasionally drop cues and yeah. occasionally they used to alter the beginning and the end, you know, so it ended early or something like that, <clears throat> but not very much. So the answer is, yeah, quite a bit of influence on it. Yeah. Really. Uh, and I think they, you know, they decided you were doing the music, therefore that's what you gave them it was what it was. And there wasn't a really time or money to do much else. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I think that's... I mean, you hear of things now, don't you, with uh, they'll do a whole score. I think James Bond, wasn't it? They did a whole score for it and uh, just decided they'd do something else and got somebody else in completely. Yeah. You know, yeah, well, that happens a that's lot a million well. quid, you know, to yeah. do that. Yeah. It was, it's David Arnold does the Bond stuff now, I think, isn't it? Is it David Arnold? It's somebody. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Somebody like, so at that time then, when you were with the workshop, and sort of more, you know, what sort of, did you have your own specific room? Because I've seen sort of interviews of Peter and he had his room with the CS80 and his App Odyssey. Yeah. What sort of, what did you have then? Was it, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah, I had, um, I had room 13. Uh, which is mainly where I worked, and that that was um, ended up with a Neve desk in there actually, and a sixteen track machine. But it was uh, uh, eight tracks mainly up, up until that time yeah. of uh, yeah. multi track. <clears throat> I had um, a, a Roland uh, Jupiter Four, nice, which was very nice. Is that um, the wooden sided? It's got wooden seems, sides. Yeah. Um, nice sort of coffee table look. Yeah, to it. lovely. <laughs> and uh, an arpeggiator, that was a new thing at the time. Yeah. Uh, it had in there. And uh, I also used an SY2, which was a Yamaha machine, yeah. which was mono, you know, it wasn't uh, poly, polyphonic. Yeah. It, 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 um, and it had lots of slightly orchestral sounding presets, plus you could make sounds on it. Mm. Um, and then I, I had an Oberheim OBX, which was a really rather nice thing. Yeah. Um, and um, Arp Odyssey, favourite all-time thing. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, and I did have... Um, I'm just trying to think. Uh, I, did, I did buy myself an Arp... Um, 
what's it called? Avatar, which is a oh. guitar synthesizer. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> is that the little box, which, isn't it? That sort of just is it oscillators? Well, it, it looks and... exactly like an uh, uh, an art um, odyssey. Yeah, exactly the same box and everything, sort of sloping front, and all the same controls and everything, plus a few extra ones for the guitar yeah. input. And you you got a pickup which you um, uh, could mount on a guitar, yeah. which had six a hex pickup, six pickups, all built in, so it would track all the strings individually. Yeah, uh, um, it was a bit um, unstable, but you know that was the way it was. I've got it still. I must get it out and fall, fall around with it. Again. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Quite fun. Yeah, it did a thing as well called hex fuzz. Which meant that it it fuzzed each string individually, making a kind of right, uh, okay. a clean uh, fuzz. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> so, that's the thing with fuzz. It's sort of you can forget your chords go out of the window with most of it. It just sort of becomes a sort of a, a, a mush. mush. Yeah. So, yeah. But how... anyway, that was that was what I had. And there was uh, an echo room which supplied the reverb. Mm. Um, uh, that was just, I mean, towards the end, I, got, I think I got a, um, an AMS digital, you know, which was... Yeah, yeah, big... big like early delays. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, all the kind of usual tape fiddling around yeah. gear. How much of that stuff have you still got then, of your own sort of gear? How much of that still have you still kept? Um, well, I... I, I not that much, really. Um, yeah. But I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sort of making most of my stuff on Arturia and those yeah. sorts of things, or uh, you know the plugins because it's so much easier. Yeah. Um, so um, but I'm not much of a collector, I'm afraid. Yeah. That's yeah. The, it's yeah. it's just so much easier now, isn't it? That everything is just stored in there, and things like main stage and you know the sort of live oh, programs I love the make it. Stage. They just make yeah. it so easy now that it's just it's always there yeah. and it's always the same, and it doesn't go out of tune. No, you know. no, the main stage is wonderful. Yeah, I have got um, I've got a couple actually. I've got I've got a guitar which is um, uh, w- which stays in tune all the time mm. because it's not the very expensive version with a mechanical system yeah. that, that, that that compensates. It's one that does uh, like a, a a kind of pitch change thing yeah. on it, and it constantly controls that. That's clever. Um, and uh, they're fun. And I've also got another one, which is a, a Stratocaster, which was uh, has a sort of Roland modification in it, uh, yeah, which will yeah. give you... You have to tune it up properly to start with. But once it's in tune, you can switch between open G or uh, you can do a kind of minor So you can thing. sort of you digitally change the tuning. Thing. You can change the tuning. As long as you don't try and listen to the, what the strings are doing at the yeah, same just... time. As... <laughs> Yeah. Um, but but it's very clever and it, it's uh, the latency is very good. You know, there's yeah. nothing, n- no problem about playing. It's a really good fun thing to yeah. have. So moving forward in time a little bit, obviously now mm. the the workshop has become a touring entity. How did that sort of yeah. how did that come about? Where where did that sort of idea was that Mark Ayres that sort of um, Peter Howell. And Mark Ayers were talking to somebody at the Roundhouse about doing a show. And uh, they got it off the ground, and I got a call saying, do you want to be in this? And I said, that sounds great, yes. (laughs) And uh, went home, and I didn't sleep for two nights. (laughs) Because, you know, I've done gigs in awful venues, you know. I mean, I've done, you know, dinner dance. That, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with this <laughs> world. Um, East End weddings, dinner dances, all that sort of thing on yeah. guitar with a complete band of strangers very often. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I've done all that sort of stuff, played in restaurants, coming home smelling of chips. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've got that kind of T-shirt. Yeah. 
<coughs> of busking around in th at things, but um, never done anything really uh, remotely like a concert at the Roundhouse. Mm. So I called Mark Ayers back and said, I, I don't think I can do this. Um, it, it's not really me, you know, I've, you know, it'd be fun, but I, I mean, just going to be, be a nightmare. And I'd probably go wrong and all the rest of it. Um, so he said, he sort of calms me down and said, yeah, no, it's fine, you know, we'll have time to rehearse and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So eventually I came around to the idea, but it was quite a frightening thing mm. to take on yeah. uh, for me. Um, but it was great. I'm so glad I did it because that led on, Actually, there was quite a big gap before uh, between the Roundhouse show and the next show was, which was in uh, Port Mary in Wales. Oh, uh, not fair. <laughs> a few years later, uh, and um, lots of festivals after that, which yeah. was uh, just great fun, really good fun yeah. doing those. So, what's is there a plan going forward for the workshop to uh, carry on? doing some gigs because i didn't catch any of them the first time around well um it'd be nice i'd love to do some more yeah um but um they kind of tailed off and i don't know whether that was because <laughs> there wasn't a doctor who anniversary at the time because uh, people sort of focus on that doctor who yeah. thing a lot which i can understand the, why they do yeah. that but uh um so uh the answer is I don't know, um, and um, you know the the management keep their uh, cards very closely yeah, no. to their, and of course yeah, I mean, the lockdown didn't help. No, yeah, yeah. at all. Uh, and we did do um, a Zoom. Yeah. Type. So, so yeah. how how did that work with your latency? Did you all have to sort of how did how did that um, work? Well, um, the the way it worked was um, we had. Um, we had a, a, a no, what's it called now? Um, sorry, I can't remember the name of the program. Um, Audio Movers, it's called. Right. And um, and I, you know, uh, started playing about with Audio Movers with uh, uh, Bob Erland, who's plays with us yeah. and also is very technically minded. Uh, and um, what we realised we could do is if I started playing, let's say, mm. he could join in and um, there were no latency problems. Um, but I wouldn't be able to hear what he was doing as he mm. was playing. Uh, so it's like the last in the chain is the actual... Uh, the, it's the one who who can't, you know, it, it depends. I can, yes, the, the last in the chain can hear you and he can hear himself so he's he's know, the lucky one got the usual <laughs> thing whereas the first person can't so right and he said well if we were to do ethereal type stuff well we could use it like a gigantic delay so you can actually set the delay on this thing so right. you make it two seconds so what we could do then was start one person starts hands it on to the next person Next person is playing in sync with the first, but he's playing to what he's hearing, um, but he's playing it at, in, in real terms two seconds, let's say, later. Right. And then that gets passed on to the next person and same process. Yeah. We had four all together. Uh, and uh, then the last person in the chain sends the whole thing back. So it's like a, a massive delay going on. Yeah, like, like a hundred mile of, tape loop. <laughs> it's a yeah. It's not that big. It's a, <laughs> but it's like um, the old thing that, that we used to always do at the workshop, which was lace up a tape machine and then go instead of going onto the take up spool, you'd go on round onto another tape machine, yeah. so you'd get a very long delay. Right, a mic stand was, out the corridor. Worked the same, yeah. <laughs> Same, same principle. So, uh, and that worked not bad, really. It was yeah. good fun, <clears throat> and we employed the process of making it improvisational. 
So it wasn't like somebody said, oh, well, let's do this and we'll write out some parts and do it, you know, yeah. uh, which puts you in a straitjacket. We said, no, what we'll do is we'll say, <clears throat> we'll do have a timing and we'll have several different moods, maybe different time signature, different keys, you know, which are pre-arranged. Yeah. And how do we know how to, um, how to sync that up? And we made um, a time uh, clock type thing. Right, okay. And um, somebody counted in at the beginning, and we each pressed the start on that time clock. Right. So we were all in sync. Yeah. I should explain for anybody who's listening or not aware, this was a sort of a live performance that the workshop did and you, I think you broadcast it on YouTube, wasn't it? I, I remember seeing it. Well, yeah, it was live when it was recorded. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Live-ish. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, um, but the thing was actually live, you know, yeah. so it was live. But it was too risky, really, to just do it live because uh, the internet yeah. it fails often. It might just melt. Which yeah, you, it would just melt. <laughs> if you listen to Radio 4, you'll hear interviews constantly yeah, kind of oh, dropping yeah. out. Yeah. So, but it's not uh, the greatest but um, also it's not great if uh, I won't mention any names once again but one or two people went a bit cheap on their internet connection oh uh, you know, you know, it doesn't you know <laughs> So yeah, we'll have to. I think we'll have to uh, try and get Mark Ayers on the podcast and twist his arm to sort of do a couple more shows with the workshop. So oh, yeah, he can put well, in a good word um, <laughs> just for you. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> no, festivals would be nice. Yeah. So. yeah, I think that's the sort of avenue, isn't it, for that sort of for the workshop sort of mm. feel. I think. Yes, sort of, I think so. Yeah. Um, it, 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 there is a kind of um, uh, you know feeling that uh, some some people are much more interested in the weird end of things and i think um people who go to see us probably go for the mixture of things they remember from mm. the yeah. old days of doctor who etc i don't know uh, i think so i think a mixture of things is good always I think it's so varied the workshop. All of the the stuff that went out from from Delia's day, where it's sort of more uh, music concrete. I don't like to say that more avant garde, yeah. but yeah, to the more sort of melodic stuff that came later in the eighties and the nineties, and all the yeah. BBC School stuff. It's sort of yeah, that's a hard set list to write out. You know, at least if yeah. you're playing a wedding, yeah. you can put you know, <laughs> Long Tail Sally, and you're going to end with Johnny Be Good. You know, you've you've got sort yeah. of set things that exactly. everybody's going to know. And I think yeah. Doctor Who, as great as that is for the workshop, is maybe is a little bit of a sort of a noose around the neck as well, that it's sort of there are going to be people there that just want to hear you play like your soundtrack from Logopolis or the theme, you know. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there is a huge accent on on that, huge demand for that, because lots and lots of people who, who are into it, yeah. as simple as that. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's always kind of worked and we've had fantastic audiences, you yeah. know, really people who, uh, enjoy it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been very, very rewarding experience, uh, doing it and quite sort of, I don't know what the word is, but I mean, humbling in a way that, you know, uh, to think that people still appreciate that yeah it's i think it's one of those things that it's I, I think doctor who as well much like the workshop has got this sort of resurgence of people really want to know about the stuff that went on back then mm. it sort of mm. doesn't matter what's happening now they're sort of they are really focused and like what happened in the past and that's nice to sort of that's that's a nice thing mm. that the workshop sort of shares with that so yes whilst you were funny yeah, well, sorry, whilst, yeah. So, no, sorry. <laughs> while she was sort of, um, once you'd left the workshop, or maybe whilst you were with the workshop, you did some writing for the KPM library as well. Was it just KPM that yeah. you worked for, or DeWolf, or? Well, that, that was after I left the BBC. Yeah. <coughs> mm. So, what sort of um, what stuff did you get up to then? <laughs> well, um, more conventional stuff, really. But I did quite a few things. Um, 
with uh, more orchestral sounding stuff. Yeah. Um, and there was one thing called Storytellers, which was <clears throat> meant to be themes for children's stuff. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, I did a thing called The Main Chance, which was like sort of music, which is basically for corporate type shows. Yeah. You know, where they're the kind of uh, more, more sort of poppy things. And then I did a thing called The Jingle Machine, which was uh, all sorts of short tracks. Yeah. <coughs> and jingles and theme tunes and um, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So did you Some record... of it done with cash registers and all that. Yeah. yeah. Did you record all of that stuff in... Because you used to have a studio, didn't you? Did you use your yeah, when studio I for BBC, that? Or... I opened up um, a studio in Hammersmith and, um, uh, and built it to be kind of more like a commercial studio than the workshop. Mm. <clears throat> so, so I had a big control room yeah, and enough room for, I don't know, more than a dozen musicians as well. <coughs> Sorry about this. It's um, all right. Hang on. <laughs> You're all right. So um, we've had some, we've had a couple of questions in from some of our listeners. We have. Do you want to, um, do you have. want to rattle them out? Some quick fires. Mm. Uh, maybe not that quick. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go that quick. Yeah. I'll prompt. Um, so Liam from Motion Picture Podcast ask, uh, asks, um, where your inspirations came about? Uh, when he did Around the World in 80 Days and Pole to Pole? Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, once again, I made it up as I went along. I'll message him. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> that, that's about it, really. But uh, They got me to do uh, a demo for the theme tune mm. uh, of uh, Around the World in 80 Days. That's such a and... memorable theme tune as well, mm. I've got to say. My, well, it... it it, it, I started off with something much more like a holiday program type mm. theme tune. And I actually hired a sax player to play some nice things. <clears throat> and then I did something else. I can't remember. I did a couple of things. And um, they said, oh, well, mm, uh, not sure, really. And they said, uh, We'll ask Michael what he thinks about it. And he said, oh, just have a big <laughs> bass drum banging out a thing or something, you know, <laughs> and um, and a trombone or something. So I thought, well, yeah, um, kind of Englishman abroad. Yeah. Hmm. Slightly eccentric thing might be good. So I, I did a demo uh, and th they liked it. And so I went ahead and did it with uh, horns and trumpet and uh yeah uh, it, it worked quite well i think yeah. um <clears throat> for that then they were doing pole to pole and they wanted something different from that because it was more of a hardcore adventure yeah they saw that as then around the world in 80 days was was him being fairly sort of jolly with everybody yeah and there was there was that aspect in pole to pole, but it was a serious thing, and they could have actually uh, <clears throat> gone into serious trouble on that because yeah. that was a dangerous project. So it needed something slightly different, I think. There. Yeah. So, um, but uh, I did use real musicians playing tunes on those yeah. with a bit of synth, you know, added, and basically going with the. The sort of feel of the different places they were in. Did you do the incidental music for Around the World in Eighty Days as well? Yeah, yeah. Because I, I yeah. always seem to remember that's something that was before I was sort of aware of like of who'd even written the music for Around the World in Eighty Days. I remember yeah, being yeah. very young, and it was sort of, I think it was being repeated on on a channel. It went out lots of times. Yeah, yeah. Did, yeah. And mm -hmm. I always remember the music being very sort of. Uh, it matched up with where he was. If he was in Egypt, yeah, you know, it really matched up really well. Yeah, yeah. And um, that's what I quite like doing is sort of fitting things so the mood works. Yeah. And um, and also you can turn on a sixpence and uh, suddenly change. 
yeah. if something's going wrong or yeah. more optimistic or less. So um, yeah, hit the Liam, panic button. Liam does ask as well. Um, well, was it fun creating the variations of the main theme for the different geographical locations? Yes, areas? and um, it, it 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 was lucky that the theme kind of lent itself to that because because when I wrote the theme to start with it was intended as just a sort of title music mm. and perhaps closing over the over the credits um but uh, the tune seemed to lend itself to a, a different kind of you know full of eastern promise kind of version or a yeah um a sort of downbeat thing if things were going wrong so it was good fun doing that and uh, I had a little bit of experience doing that previously in a series called Global Report, which was kind of a current affairs program which goes out around Christmas. And I'd done a few things yeah. with that kind of approach. So uh, that's that's where I got that idea from. I was really. just yeah, I was just trying to think because the theme is quite pentatonic, isn't it, from what I can sort of think. So it does sort of it makes it a little bit easier to move it around and match it because I think sometimes yes. if you've got yeah. if you've got a funny note in there, it's, it makes it a nightmare to sort of change it around a little bit. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a fairly straight yeah. uh, tune. Yeah, yeah. Have we got any other questions? <laughs> we do. Oh, go on then. Um, yeah. yeah, take it. Yeah. Sonia asks, uh, what were your fondest memories about working on Doctor Who? Um, Doctor Who, working with um, Peter Moffat, mm. um, who was my favourite director on that. He did... Um, let's, okay, I've got a list of what he did, actually. How uh, he did Mordering Undead, <laughs> um, <laughs> which was a Peter... Peter Davidson one, yeah. which was a, uh, but the first one uh, I did for him was State of Decay, mm. which was in 1980. And um, uh, he didn't do Legopolis, but he also, he did The Visitation. And that was a fun thing to do with a uh, kind of bit of a med medieval type yeah. feel to it. And um, so that working with him was great because he was a, uh, uh, he was uh, he'd been around doing series of all kinds mm. for years and years, and um, he was very entertaining, very amusing, <clears throat> and could cope with absolutely anything because he'd worked in the days when uh, things were done live, you know, dramas, if you can believe that. Um, and apparently he'd worked on Coronation Street, which used to at one time be live. Yeah. And they used to just do the whole thing uh, there and then. <clears throat> and he said it was uh, it, it was all very well when it was live because occasionally the actors would forget their lines and it, you know, yeah. there'd be a horrible kind of uh, hiatus or uh, the set the set would kind of collapse, collapse or, <laughs> you know, the... the a door would know, you know, those sorts of things. Yeah. <clears throat> and he said it was fine because you'd go home and um, you didn't see it. You saw yeah. it, obviously you saw it in the director's uh, position, but you wouldn't, um, <clears throat> you wouldn't have the agony of watching it at home. And he said, and then they brought in Vizio tape, oh. um, um, but they weren't allowed to edit it. So they used to record it in the afternoon or something. <clears throat> and the set would once again collapse, or the uh, the actors would dry up, and um, so right, that's it. But, yeah. but it it went out as it was, and you had the horror of seeing it at yeah. home and knowing this sort of mistake was yeah. going to go out. That nail is, <laughs> is firmly in your coffin now forever. Mm. That's you know that's not going yeah, anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, so to so, say, um, but he it's, that, that's a sort of you know he 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 marvelous sort of. Uh, Director and very yeah. good with act as well, you know. Yeah, could make it you no know, happen. So uh, to just sort of finish off Sonia's question, then, out of all of the episodes of Doctor Who, all the stories, sorry, that you did, which do you think is your sort of, which one do you think's your best? Uh, there's no sort of better way to phrase it, I don't think. I, well, or which do you I prefer? Don't know. I think the visita visitation was pretty good, um, but I, don't, I, um, I think. Because of the 
Legopolis really because of what was in it yeah was good because it has the the music has some impact there really yeah. and um I was quite happy about the way it turned out at yeah. the time I'd probably do it a bit better now but I mean you know you, can't, you can always do things yeah. a bit better but it, it did did all kind of work together I think yeah. that one hindsight's yeah. a wonderful thing that's great isn't yeah. it <laughs> isn't that great it's great it is isn't very it? easy isn't it it's yeah it's great <clears throat> so yeah have you any future music plans is there anything sort of coming up um I'd quite like to sort of redo some of the cues from the Hitchhiker's Guide mm. and um remake them I don't know as a sort of uh, just a piece, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> but I haven't got around to doing that yet. But that would be quite a nice thing to do. Yeah. Um, but I have got, um, I have written a book. <gasps> Plug away. So <laughs> uh, it's going to be called Rocking at the BBC, um, in brackets, still in love with Auntie. And it's about my time working there. So it's not radiophonic workshop history or anything like that at mm. all. Um, although I, I cover that and talk about the people who were there and much like we were talking today. But I also talk about joining the BBC in the 60s and going to the training place, which yeah. is up in Evesham. Yeah. And, um, oh dear, somebody's at my door. Hang on. Do you mind if I go and get No, it's that? all right. Don't worry. Don't worry. You're all right. Are, are we allowed to pause? We're oh, allowed yeah. to pause. We're not live. Don't worry. It's a... Okay. Yeah. Uh, just pause there. Yeah, don't worry. You're all right. <laughs> mm. Sweaty palms, I have. <laughs> Always do. When I talk to people, I always it's it's, it's a nasty thing. Hmm. You know, they, they you can cure it. Chop them off. No, there's a a thing in your arm there where if you cut it, I should give it. A not go. not yourself, but you can get an operation. There's things like ninety five percent success rate that you won't get sweaty palms. Cross anymore. fingers. Obviously, you have to get both sides. Can't just one. Yeah. <laughs> It'll all just go to that one hand then. Yes. Double up. No doubt. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. So um. One day, maybe. maybe. Now I'm doing a babysitting evening, so oh. my family have just arrived. No problem. They're right. They're in the room. We'll we'll, no we'll be wrapping up soon. Uh, where do we? Yeah. Oh, you, so yes, yeah, so the book. Yeah, uh, I told you what it was called. Mm -hmm. uh, Rocking at the BBC. Brackets still in love with Aunt, and it's about uh, my time at the BBC, including Radiophonic Workshop. But it doesn't focus on that. Mm. But I do talk about all that stuff. Yeah, <clears throat> hopefully a few amusing things in it. Plenty of stories. And now uh, I'm not sure when it's coming out, but uh, it will sh soon. I hope it will happen. <clears throat> it will happen. So uh, we'll tell yeah. everybody to sort of uh, keep their eyes peeled on your website, paddykingsland.com, yeah. making sure to you know, yeah, give that a little plug. And I'll probably plug it on Facebook when it. Comes. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I saw the post you did a couple of weeks ago about the vinyl editions. Yes, of, uh, yes. Listen for the light. It's yeah, they look great. <clears throat> Everything looks great on vinyl as well. It's you know, it's, oh, yeah. it's nice. To just it is a that. nice thing to do. And uh, actually, it's so well done now. Yeah, they're so good at that. Very, very good. Mm. Did you have to wait long for that? Because I know like the pressing yeah. now is horrendous. It takes sort of yeah, July till Christmas or something. Nice. So and then one, of the stamp... <laughs> <clears throat> one of the stampers broke. Ah. Yeah, you had to delay part of the order, but uh, that's okay. But uh, they were very good. Yeah, a company called Mobinico, which is in Taiwan, the manufacturing bid is, and uh, yeah. I think you know you can talk to them in England. Uh, they have an office here, but very, very good. Yeah, interesting. I'll write that down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Um, so there's plenty of stuff happening in the in the world of Paddy Kingsland. So uh, I just want to yes. say thank you so much for doing this. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. It's yeah, a uh, real pleasure. It's been lovely to talk to you, and hopefully we can do this again. And hopefully, if the Radiophonic Workshop ever decide to do something again, we'll come along and uh, we'll come and say hello in person. And uh, yes, absolutely, it'd be They'd great. Come, come around and see us. Yeah, yeah it'd be great. 
So, yeah. So, Mr. Paddy Kingsland, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been a pleasure. Um, yeah, it's been great. It's been great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, really good. Enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. Sing. Sing. Sing.